Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Brian Shapiro, a market segment manager at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. It's entitled, Does All Disease Begin in the Gut? Monitoring the Barrier Function of an In Vitro Gut Mimic, presented by Ms. Alina Hirvlet. Ms. Hirvlet is an application scientist at LockSense. In this presentation, Ms. Hirvlet will evaluate the requirements of a representative GI mimic and provide a protocol to fabricate this in vitro model. She will then discuss impedance spectroscopy as a measurement tool to monitor transepithelial electrical resistance to analyze GI barrier function. Finally, she will demonstrate the physiological relevance of the in vitro gut model by using chemical compounds to modulate the GI barrier function. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. But first, a quick word about ATCC. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and services center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We are an innovative company featuring gene editing, differentiated stem cells, and advanced toxicological models. So with that, I would like to welcome Alina Hirvlet. Thank you, Brian, for the kind introduction. And indeed, today we're going to talk about the gut, where all disease begin, according to Hippocrates. For this presentation, we will start with an introduction about the gut the function of the guts, followed by the in vitro translation of the guts. Then I will give a crash course about impedance spectroscopy and transanothelial electrical resistance, better known as TEAR. I will show two models to interfere with the gut barrier, and I will show how we can quantify the barrier function using impedance, which will lead to some conclusions. So let's start with the gut function. The gut is the first line of defense against all xenobiotic compounds that enter the body via eating or drinking. The gut needs to filter all these compounds. Nutrients need to pass, while toxins need to be repelled. Therefore, the gut needs a good functioning barrier. If the barrier function of the gut is insufficient, toxins can spread through the body and harm all other organs. This is how liver disease develops. But an impaired gut is also linked to study disorders and mood swings. Furthermore, it can worsen other diseases, such as inflam inflammation during COPD. It is important to have a representable gut mimic, because with this mimic, you can investigate which factors influence the barrier function, and you can investigate the crosstalk between the gut and other organs to better understand disease progression. The aim of this webinar is to propose a representable gut mimic and to evaluate the barrier function of this gut mimic. This brings us to the next topic, an in vitro translation of the guts. During this webinar, we are going to discuss three factors that influence this mimic. First of all, the cell type which cells are used in the gut mimic, and how many different cells are we going to use. We are going to discuss the optimal culturing medium, including necessary supplements. And lastly, we are going to discuss 2D or 3D structures to make an in vivo-like situation. The gut consists of multiple different cells at different locations. The villi are the tip of the gut, that is in contact with the nutrients and toxins. Here you can find enterocytes. Enterocytes are the most abundant cell type, 
of the gut and they carry out the main function, which is nutrient absorption. You can also find goblet cells which produce mucus. This mucus help, helps the digestion and absorption of nutrients. Lastly, you have enteroendocrine cells that produce hormones and cup cells, of which the function is not yet completely clear. The cribs are further away from the nutrients. From the cribs, cells mature and grow towards the tip, the fili. In the cribs, you can find penneth cells, which are involved in the regulation of the gut microbiota. Lastly, in the gut, you can find microfolds or M cells, which are in contact with the immune system, and tuft cells, which are also in contact with the immune system and are thought to be involved in taste perception. For an in vitro model, it is vital to find the balance between, on the one side, easy, reproducible and understandable, and on the other side, complex, in vivo-like, but also more difficult to reproduce and to understand. With fewer cells, the mimics is easier to reproduce and to understand, while the, with more cells, the mimic is more in vivo-like, but also more difficult to work with and maybe overcomplicated. We think that you can create a reproducible and in vivo-like mimic with two different cell types. Of course, we're going to use enterocytes in our mimic, since this is the most abundant cell type. The CACO2 entero enterocyte cell line is a representable cell line that can form a heterogeneous monolayer in culture. These cells are derived from the colon and ATCC provides a robust strain which is used in this research. In addition, we use the goblet-like human cell line. H229MTX mucus-producing cells increase the representability by adding an in vivo-like mucus layer. Both cells are both cells are cultured in more or less the same medium, except for FPS concentration, which is high in CO2 cells. We culture the cells in a 9 to 1 ratio, which is an in vivo-like ratio. These cell types share their love for favorite culturing medium, being DMEM F12 supplemented with preferably glutamax or otherwise glutamine. This medium is further supplemented with 1% non-essential amino acids, 1% penstrap during formation of the monolayer. Recently, the impact of the microbiome on barrier function has been explained. Therefore, penstrap is removed from the medium when the cells are subjected to barrier interfering agents. As discussed in the previous slide, Gecko 2 cells prefer 20% FPS and goblet-like cells prefer 10%. So here we used 15% as a compromise. Furthermore, both cell types are adherent cells, so they are passaged via trypsin EDTA. Lastly, we will discuss the 3D culturing methods. One of the drawbacks of in vitro cell culture is the lack of in, uh, in vivo-like 3D cell culture. Conventional culturing is performed on a 2D plastic well. Here we use a slightly more advanced culturing technique, the trans well. In vivo, the epithelial cells are in contact with a wet layer on both sides, the gut interior on the apical side and the blood vessel on the basolateral side. This situation is best mimicked on a trans well where the basolateral side of the cells is not the bottom of a plastic well plate, but a trans well membrane, which allows interaction with the lower compartment. For good adhesion, the trans well membrane is coated with collagen. The complete workflow is as follows. First, the membrane is collagen coated by a short incubation of collagen diluted in PBS. This PBS solution is added to the membrane for 30 minutes. Then 10,000 cells are added in the previously discussed medium using a 9 to 1 ratio. These cells are cultured for three weeks to form a robust cell layer. The medium is refreshed three times a week. This protocol leads to a matured heterogeneous co-culture as depicted in this figure. Here, the green visualizes wheat germ agglutinin, which is a mucus marker. 
This staining is significantly more present in a co-culture with HD29MTX cells compared to a monoculture of only CACO2 cells. DAPI, you probably all know, is a nucleus marker and actin, a cytoskeleton marker, showing completely covered strands well. Now it's time for a crash course impedance spectroscopy and tear. For impedance measurements, an alternating current is applied. This means an electrical current does not only flow from electrode 1 to electrode 2, but it can also change from electrode 2 to electrode 1. This switching happens at different frequencies. When the electrical current flows from one electrode to the other, it passes certain obstacles. These obstacles, for example, are the cell layer. They are either a resistor or a reactance. All these obstacles together form, a measure, form the measured impedance. The dominance of the resistor and the reactances on the total impedance is different at different frequencies. At low frequencies, for example, the total impedance is mostly determined by the present resistors, while at high frequencies, the total impedance is mostly determined by the present reactances. A wide frequency range elucidates a lot of information about all the components of the circuit. A very important component is the tear. This is the electrical resistance of the cell layer and caused by the tight junctions. A higher tear means more tight junctions and thereby a better barrier function. The tear can be extracted from the impedance data. But total impedance is more than only tear. Impedance is the sum of the resistors and the reactances. The difference between the resistors and reactances are explained here. Resistance is a constant and always increases the total impedance. The most important reactance you will find in a biological cell layer is a capacitance. A capacitance works different than a resistance. Instead of consistent impedance of the electrical circuit, a capacitance can hold and release electrical charge. Whether this impedes or facilitates the electrical current is dependent on the frequency. A resistance can be compared with swimming. It takes longer to get to the other side, but going is continuous. A capacitance can be compared to a ferry boat. You might have to wait for other pa passengers, but once it takes off, it's traveling fast. Measuring the impedance is performed with a set of two electrodes, one on the apical side of the trans wall and one on the basolateral side. Current flows up and down between those two electrodes and the impedance over this current over the whole path or circuit is measured. In this video, you can see an animation of the measurement. This is a trans well containing well. One electrode is positioned inside the trans well and the other one outside. Current flows up and down through the cell layer. The impedance of the current by the cells is measured. The impedance gives information about the whole circuit, but we want to know tear. In order to find the tear, we do circuit model fitting. So we need to fit a model that corresponds with all the obstacles, being resistors and capacitors, on our path. In this slide, we are going to walk the path the electrical current runs, and we are going to name all the obstacles we encounter. First, we start with the electrode medium interface. This is a resistance capacitance combination also called an RC circuit. In an RC circuit, the current can choose to either move through the resistance path or the capacitance path. Whether the current chooses the capacitance path or the resistance path is dependent on the frequency. The medium is a resistance. Then we reach the apical side of the cells. Here we again encounter an RC circuit. The current can choose to move through the tight junctions, which is a resistance, or through the cell membrane, a capacitance. The tight junction resistance is called R tight, and the capacitance is called C mem. The basolateral side of the cells 
also behave as an RC circuit, where the current can again choose to flow through the tight junctions or flow through the cell membrane. Past the cells, we reach the collagen-coated transwell membrane, which is covered with cells. This membrane acts like a resistance. Lastly, we reach the other electrode, which is again a combination of a resistance and a capacitance. So now we have the whole circuit with all its components. Zooming in on the impedance caused by the cells, we see two RC circuits and a cell transwall interface. For the RC circuits, it's important to note that the, cho the choice is to either go through, this, uh, through the cell membrane, the capacitors, or the tight junctions, the resistors. The total tear is the sum of the apical tight junction and the basolateral tight junction. With circuit model fitting and full spectrum impedance results, you can assign a value to each component of the electrical circuit and thereby find the tear. This brings us to interfering with the tight junctions. First, a short recap of tight function junctions. When talking about tight junctions in the perspective of tear, we mean all junctions that contribute to the barrier function. So the tight junctions, which are composed of different proteins, such as cloudins and oclidins, but also adherence junctions, which consist of e ketserin and ketanin, and more towards the base lateral side, desmosomes, which also contributes to the barrier integrity. EGTA is a component with an extremely long name I'm not going to pronounce, can interfere with the tight junctions. In a healthy situation, there's calcium between the cells and outside the cells. This concentration of calcium in it is in balance. EGTA can bind to the free calcium and capture it, and thereby EGTA reduces the concentration of free calcium. To stabilize the concentration, calcium bound to adherence junction is released. The adherence junctions and tight junctions are broken up to release the calcium. After breaking of the junctions, the proteins are engulfed by the cell via, via endocytosis. Here is a visual representation of the free calcium being captured, which leads to the release of adherence junctions bound calcium and junction proteins being engulfed. Lactobacillus acidophilus, hereafter called LA, is a bacterium that is thought to improve tight junctions. LA can bind to toll-like receptor 2 and activate it. Activation of TLR2 leads to interaction of TLR2 with TLR1 or TLR6. These complexes, in turn, can lead to upregulation of oclidin. Since oclidin is a vital protein of the tight junctions, LA can thereby improve the barrier function. So we know what AGTA and LA theoretically can do to the barrier function, and we have a way of measuring the barrier function. It's time for some experiments. This is the total setup of the experiment. As discussed before, KCO2 cells and HT29 MTX cells are cultured on a collagen-coated trans wall for three weeks. One day before barrier interference, the penstrap medium is removed and fresh, no penstrap containing medium is added. This way, the penstrap cannot impair the LA. Then the cells are treated with control medium, LA containing medium, or EGTA, and impedance, is me impedance measurements are performed. A baseline measurement was performed at T0. Directly after the measurement, LA was added to the LA wells. After 24 hours, the measurement was performed. After this measurement, the medium of the EGTA wells was collected and replaced with one millimolar EGTA in PBS. This was incubated for 45 minutes. After incubation, the PBS was removed and the old medium was added. A new measurement was performed. This was repeated for two more days. This is what raw impedance data looks like at T0, the baseline measurements. All lines 
represent a single well and the impedance is depicted as a function of the frequency. Three days later at T73, you can already see big difference between the baseline measurement and the final measurements. But we are specifically interested in the tear. As discussed, circuit model fitting can assign a specific value to all electrical components and thereby extract the tear from the impedance data. Here, the tear is depicted as a function of the time. You already see a lot of differences between the conditions, but we will go through them step by step. Let's first have a closer look at the healthy control. You see measurements at uh, different time points. 0, 24 and 25 hours, 48 and 49 hours, and 72 and 73 hours. Remarkably, there are some differences between the time points before and after EGTA addition. This is unexpected since EGTA is not added to the control. The medium is the same at 24 hours as well as 25 hours. What did happen was that the wells plate was taken out of the incubator, the well plate was used, the well plate was put back into the incubator, etc., etc. All this handling can change the temperature of the medium and the cells, and the temperature has a great influence on the measured impedance, and this can also affect the tear results. Even, even though these changes might seem impressive in the graphs, it is not significant. We can state that temperature does not significantly change the tear results. Now, let's see the difference between control and LA. We can see that LA follows the tear results of the con control quite closely. The temperature influence seems higher than the influence of the LA addition, and the influence is therefore also not significant. While the hypothesis based on literature was that the tear would increase by LA, these data are still useful. While this bacterium does not increase the barrier at the used concentration, it also does not harm the cells. There are several different substrains of LA. This substrate on its own does not improve the tear. It is possible we need a cocktail of bacteria or a cocktail of LA strains, which will be investigated in future experiments. Each TA, on the other hand, does significantly change the barrier function. Not only is the difference between control and EGA significant, the relative tear is close to zero. The barrier function is completely gone. <laughs> to emphasize that this difference is indeed caused by the addition of EGTA, we compared the before and the after measurement results. EGTA causes a significant decline in barrier function. Interesting here is that the decline is always to about 10% of the initial value. Tight junctions and adherent junctions are responsible for 90% of the total tear value. Since EGTA only hides the calcium ions, we wanted to see if removing EGTA could restore the barrier function. While the recovery is not up to 100%, we do see significant improvement of the barrier function. This illustrates that EGTA treatment is reversible. This brings us to the conclusions. First, the conclusions about the cell culture procedure. A CACO2 HT29MTX co-culture is a presentable in vitro co-culture that is able to form a heterogeneous cell layer with a robust barrier function and mucus production. The optimal and in vivo lag ratio is 9 to 1. The optimal culture medium of the co-culture is DMEM F12 Glutamax culturing medium with 1% non-essential -amin non amino acids and, comprises of, and a compromise of 15% FPS. A fully differentiated functional gut barrier is established after three weeks of culture, after which cells can be subjected to compounds that tamper with the barrier function. Impedance spectroscopy is a non-destructive measurement technique that can qualitatively measure the impedance of the barrier over a broad frequency spectrum. 
Circuit model fitting is an independent way to extract the tear data from complex impedance measurements. The used Artemis device is an automated, user-friendly and time-saving spectrometer that reduces cross-contamination by using a separate electrode pair for each well. Temperature influences but not significantly changes the tear, as we have seen from the control group. LA does not significantly influence the tight junction barrier, indicating no harmful effects, but also no positive effects on its own. EGTA successfully hampers with the tight junctions and reduces the barrier function to nearly non-existing. EGTA barrier function impairment is reversible, as we have seen from the significant increase of tear after EGTA removal. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge that I have not carried out these experiments myself. This work is a collaboration between LogSense and Applied Stem Cell Technologies Group at the University of Trenton. The work is conceptualized and carried out by Lena Koch under the supervision of her PI, Karen Broersen. The measurements are done with the Artemis impedance spectrometer, which is provided by LogSense. Thank you for your attention. You can follow us on LinkedIn for updates or email us for questions about Artemis. For now, I'm happy to take all your questions about this presentation. Oh, thank you, Alina. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. And it looks like we've had uh, quite a few questions come in already. Uh, let's go ahead and start with our first one. As I understand with circuit model fitting, you can assign values to all the parameters contributing to total impedance. Are there any other parameters which could be of valuable information? Hi, Brian. That's an excellent question. And yes, indeed. Besides tear, the cell capacitance, here called CMEM, can also be very helpful. It can explain something about the maturity of the cells, because fully differentiated cells have a higher capacitive value compared to non-differentiated cells. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, you do not see any protective effects of the LA. Um, have you tested its activity? Yes, before we added the LA, we have tested the activity and we added the same amount of colony active units to each well, and that was 10 to the power eight. Excellent. So, uh, Alina, uh, you use a KCO2 H29 MTX cult co culture. Uh, can I also use normal HT29 cells? Yes, it's possible to use normal HT29 cells, cells in a co culture with KCO2 cells. This is also a widely used gut model. However, it's important to know some differences. HD29 MTX is a specific mucus producing strain, and therefore it produces significantly more mucus compared to normal HD29 cells. This mucus can be important for the invasion of several toxins during a toxicology study. Also, the tear of HD29 MTX cells is lower compared to normal HD29 cells. And this lower tear is more in vivo like making the KCO2 HD29 D29 MTX model more physiologically relevant. Nice, nice explanation there. Um, now, wouldn't it be easier to just use a tier meter instead of impedance uh, instead of an impedance spectrometer? It might have been easier, but actually full spectrum impedance analysis has a couple of advantages compared to a normal tear meter. 
because a normal tear measurement uses a single frequency, but it's not necessarily the frequency where the tear is dominant. The influence of all electrical elements, such as the cell capacitance, plays a, uh, play a role in this measurement. But you do, know, uh, you do not know the influence of these factors on the final results. With full spectrum impedance measurements and circuit model fitting, you can better calculate the value of each component. Furthermore, full spectrum impedance measurements can tell something about cell development, as we discussed before. All right. Now, you've mentioned that uh, temperature influences the measurement. Uh, could you also measure impedance inside an incubator? Excellent question. And yes, this ARPANET device can be used inside the uh, incubator. It consists of two parts, one with a lot of electrical hardware, which does not like 37 degrees Celsius, and the smart lid. The smart lid with the electrodes can be placed inside the incubator, so you can do measurements at 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98 Fahrenheit. Nice, nice. Now, um, as I understand from your presentation correctly, the electrodes are positioned inside the cell medium. So how can you ensure that this is sterile, say, if you want to make multiple measurements over time? So what you want to do is make sure that the smart lips, which is indeed in contact with the cells, is sterile. The electrodes from the, uh, the smart lip can be detached from the smart lid, and this can be out of place, which makes it sterile. But the whole smart lid can be cleaned with ethanol. Okay, good, that makes sense. Um, now, do you always have to start a measurement yourself, or can you plan a measurement? You can also plan measurements. It's a semi-automatic system. So for example, if you want to measure every hour overnight, you just put that in the settings, and you place a smart lid on top of the weld plate, and then you can measure, it will automatically measure every hour. You do not have to be present to uh, start every measurement. Nice, nice. Uh, extending that a little bit, uh, how long does it actually take to perform a measurement? That's dependent on many different factors. So. Each measurement will first have a calibration step. This takes a minute or two. And after that, the measurements will be performed. So if you do full spectrum analysis, that will take a little bit longer than when you have short, uh, a smaller frequency spectrum. And also, if you only are interested in two or three wells, it will take less time compared to a full well plate. But a full well plate with 24 wells and full frequency analysis will take you about 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, good, good. Now, um, I'm going to kind of be combining uh, a couple of questions together um, around this one. So, is the Artemis specific for gut cultures, or can it be also um, used to measure the barrier of other cell culture, cell type cultures? Um, and maybe, you know, extend that into, um, you know, some of the other different applications the instrument could be used for? So it can be used for different applications, not only the gut. The most important part is that uh, there's a monolayer or a multiple layer, and you have one electrode on one side and one electrode on the other side. So as long as it's cultured in a trans well, you can measure the barrier function of the cell layer. But also in a chip, you can measure it if you have one electrode on the uh, one side and one electrode on the other side. We already have circuit models for the gut, the skin, lungs, and the blood-brain barrier. But also other uh, cultures are possible. All right. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. Um, and, and thank you for uh, being Johnny on the spot with that question. Uh, could you extract here another way um, other than circuit model fitting? Yes, in literature you can find many different ways to analyze the tear. Um, as we also have seen with a tear that only uses one frequency, 
you can choose a specific frequency and then subtract the total impedance of the blank from the total impedance of the well you're interested in. However, this is not as accurate as circuit model fitting because it's not easy to decide at which frequency you can best see the tear. Okay, good, good. Um, and uh, how would you best present tear results in your uh, publications, for example? Uh, that depends on what you want to show. So if you're only comparing your results to your own results, um, you could do it as we did, so as a percentage of the initial measurement, because we want to see the change over time. But if you want to compare your model to other models to see if you have an in vivo-like or an in vitro-like uh, tear, you can also present the tear as ohm or ohm centimeter squared. This is an absolute unit that's often used in tear. All right. Excellent, excellent. Wow. Uh, quite a few questions have come in. Um, and uh, I'm going to transition to a question that uh, has come in that's sort of related to this last one. Is there a value um, that's optimal resistance when using tier? What do you mean with a value that's optimal for tier? Do you mean a frequency or do you mean an outcome? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, let's start with uh, frequency. So we recommend to measure the frequency between 10 hertz and 100,000 hertz. But tear is usually present between 10 hertz and 1,000 hertz. But above 1,000 hertz, you can also see more about the um, development of the cells. And for example, in the skin, in the skin model, the uh, uppermost layer also shows differences at the higher frequencies. Okay, great, great. Um, we've had a, a couple more questions come in around applications. Um, I, you've pretty much been clear that uh, your group has um, made or, or worked with models for gut, skin, lung, and blood-brain barrier. Uh, would this be set up be amenable to microbiome or um, immune cells? Uh, this That's setup is totally only used. <laughs> so to uh, start with the second question, uh, in this model we only use uh, two cell types. It is possible to also put another cell type in on the apical side or the um, the basal lateral side because the uh, electrical circuit will only always find the easiest way. So they will only go through the cells that are on the trans well, and they will not go through other cells. So you can co-culture with other cells on the basal lateral side. And I believe you also had a question if it was uh, possible with a microbiome. Uh, yes, the microbiome can just be added. Um, I believe they will not completely stick uh, between tight junctions. And if they do not stick to the tight junctions, they will not influence the, uh, the tear results. And you can just measure with or without the microbiome. Nice, nice. All right. Um, now, uh, this is actually around specifically the treatment protocol that you showed uh, in your talk. So, um, Alina, when you treated the cells with uh, LA or EGTA, did you add it to the basal chamber or the apical chamber or both chambers? Ooh, I'm not 100% sure since Lena uh, did the experiments, but I believe she added the uh, EGT, the LA to both sides. Okay. Sure, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, do you have any study cases to show the increased tear value while the um, tight junctions and adherent junctions are recovering? Uh, besides this, not. But as you can see in uh, in the results that I showed earlier, is that the EGTA 
uh, can recover up to at least 60% over 24 hours. Uh, we have not tested uh, longer removal to see if it can completely recover to 100%. Okay. And that sort of answers the next question that I was about to ask. How long were you able to keep the mature transwell co-culture for experiment? We kept them in culture for four weeks. Um, but they didn't die after four weeks. So we discarded them, but uh, we haven't checked if they can live longer. Okay, so four weeks um, at minimum, but hadn't tested beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just uh, reading through this one question. Um, so this... Uh, Asker um, says that they had an experience using KCO2 cell only culture, um, but they felt their tear measurement was not robust, sometimes high, sometimes low during 21 days. Um, and they uh, also found that the general tear values were different from uh, what the literature showed. Um, and they want to know if your co-culture system is better in terms of consistency? Um, so to answer the first question about the uh, only KCO2 versus KCO2 with uh, HD29, so if you only use KCO2 cells, it's a very heterogeneous cell type. So it forms also a heterogeneous cell layer. Some cells will take over the function to produce mu mucus. And this can influence the tear results and also make it uh, less reproducible. If you have two cell lines, the uh, KCO2 cells will really have the enterocyte cell function, while the HD29 uh, MTX cells will be the mucus producing cells. Therefore, uh, I think this can give a more stable tear. Um, as you can see from the uh, figures we had, there were some differences between uh, the different uh, wells. So even within the healthy control or within the LA control, there were some differences, but they were not very big. The difference of the temperature was more than the differences between the cell types. So maybe indeed with this uh, cell culture, you will, will have less variability between your uh, group. Gotcha, gotcha. And that kind of covers some of the advantages and disadvantages of the cold culture system. Um, is there anything else that you want to share about that, or do you feel like you covered it all? Um, yeah, I think for uh, it's very important for your specific study to include HD29 uh, MTX cells. So there are some uh, diseases like cholera that really needs the mucus to enter the cells. And if you have these kind of toxicology uh, studies, I would really uh, suggest to use a cell line that can produce mucus as good as uh, this cell line can. So it's also specific for uh, your application. Okay, good, good. Um, and this next question um, might be in my court. Uh, does ATCC provide different microbial strains or standards with known uh, tier? And um, the answer to that is uh, I do not know. Um, I would be very surprised if there aren't uh, some values um, for uh, our cell lines and microbial strains that can be found in the literature. Um, but just right off the top of my head, I, I can't think of anything right off the bat. All right. And then um, let's see. So uh, this next question um, is really an application of your instrument uh, or some instrument um, in an in vivo situation. Um, and I'm not sure if it's within the scope of uh, this talk or, you know, just your uh, your area of knowledge with this. So um, feel free to decline to answer this question. But, um, Alina, I am measuring mouse intestinal permeability 
After injecting drug to the mice by IP, I am checking drug efficacy. Could you please let me know which method would be best to deliver the drug to mice? Ooh, so uh, that depends on your application. So if you want to make drugs to clinical trials, it's always very good to make an oral available drug because humans prefer to uh, take a pill over being injected every month or every week. Um, and also pills, if they end up to the gut, that's where they are present. So that's also easy to see if the gut barrier function can change to, well, also tested in vitro, but also tested uh, via oral application. All right. I good. hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, that was probably a pretty good stab at that. Um, all right, we have had, we have one final question that has come in. Um, I'm gonna make this last call. So if anyone has any further questions, please submit them now. Um, so how could one translate the tier slash tight junction barrier function analysis into gene expression assays? For example, expression of mucin genes. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? If, if not, that's perfectly okay. I'm not very familiar with mucin genes, but I do know there are, um, how we say it there, the tight junction uh, tear can be correlated with the expression of tight junction. So we also had a recent, uh, recent uh, publication about the skin, and there you could also see the changes they saw in the high frequency tear really correlated with the uh, uh, changes in uh, genes that were expressed uh, in the, the upper layer of the skin. So you do see a correlation between the fear function and the expression of tight junction genes. All right, nice answer, nice answer. Okay, well, um, at this time, we will conclude our Q&A session. I'd like to thank uh, Alina for the excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, if you are interested in um, finding out more about ATCC Toxicological Solutions, you can navigate to www.atcc.org slash talk. Uh, and for more information uh, about Artemis or LockSense in general, you can navigate to locksense.nl. Thank you everyone for attending again and having a, have a great day.